All right, as uh, we did earlier, now is your opportunity to ask any questions that you may have for either Mark or Brenda. And again, I'll ask you to please go to the podium, or the mics rather, and address the, uh, address the group there. Hmm, I just don't even know where to start so much. Uh, <laughs> so many things crossing my mind. Mark, talk to me a little bit about the uh, global milk supply situation. You and I talk about this almost every visit. You know, European Union continues to taper off on milk. You talked about Oceana. Are those, are those going to be long-term plays? I mean, it's not always about consumer demand. Sometimes it's within uh, government policy that they're almost dictating that it's going to start short in milk. No, that's, um, that's absolutely true, Pam, that uh, there are different reasons in different countries why we're seeing some contraction, but the big three milk producers in the European Union, that would be Germany, France, and uh, uh, the UK, uh, are, are all below year earlier levels. And we've also seen countries um, like Netherlands and others where they've got phosphate um, constraints on uh, what can be spread on fields that is very, very binding, actually shipping manure out of the country um, as a result of that. So production's been difficult. Same kind of thing in New Zealand. Quite often it's a weather-related impact there, but it's not entirely. They also have constraints as to how many animals they can be putting on land down there. So we think that some of these are not just passing um, opportunities uh, of poor weather, but actually are more persistent constraints that they're likely to see. So we have resources and opportunities probably to grow a lot more milk production uh, than some of those other countries do. Hey, what did you say? We have to make a different butter product for the international marketplace? Explain that. Yeah, um, our butter is typically 80% butter fat, and uh, in most other countries, um, butter is 82% butter fat. Oh. So um, they don't want our water. Am I the only butter. one that didn't know that? Yeah, yeah. Hard to spread on your toast in the morning. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious. That's interesting. Uh, Brenda, got to pivot to you. So a headline today was they found uh, almost, uh, what is it, a ton or more of uh, basically banned meat products that were in New York City coming primarily from China. You know, we're all talking about African swine fever and the possibility of when it's going to be in the United States. Okay, let's say that that does occur, not even necessarily in the United States, but one of our bordering uh, countries. How quick a pivot is that going to impact the meat paradigm? That, that, would, be a, that would be a big challenge. Um, and as you said, it's, it's kind of shocking when you look at some of the pictures of what they find coming in from some, like uh, the banned meat products that they confiscate at airports and things. Mm -hmm. um, if we end up with some of the dis those diseases basically in it, um, the, the loss of the exports is going to be devastating. Um, so if we end up with uh, ASF in the United States at some point, our export market is going to be back to, if you guys recall, 2003 for a while with um, beef. Um, it's that essential, that idea of all those export markets are going to dry up like overnight. What do we do with that? That's going to have a huge impact. Can you get them back? Yes. Um, does it take a long time? Yes. So the biosecurity, that's why we have a lot of this biosecurity, a lot of concern about being able to maintain and keep that out of the United States. Yeah, right. Anybody else got questions? Feel free. Don't, uh, you coming up, Ed? Go ahead. I'll yield to you. Yeah, Ed Legal from the Western side of the state. Question for Brenda. Looking at your cow calf numbers and feeder cattle projection numbers, do you see large dairies in Wisconsin going to sex semen for the lower part of their herd, or lower production, or heifers producing crossbred beef hosting calves? that are male then, obviously, you choose male sex semen. Do you see that as a potential? Do you, do you see it happening already? And if it is happening, is it any kind of threat to our cow-calf producers in Wisconsin for the long haul? So um, from, from a long term, yes, the trend to be able to get the 
uh, beef on dairy is um, it, it's a growing part. The the issues with that industry right now um, is that consistency. So uh, from a from a from a beef producer's point, they want that cross animal to be able to look like a beef animal and to be consistently um, perform like that. And that is possible. It's not necessarily always correctly done. So as that industry progresses, you have some of these feed yards, though, um, where they have basically contract contracts with large dairy producers, and basically they're feeding those out. So it's an area where it's growth. It's an area that is going to continue to grow. It is a, um, and so that portion of the industry is going to end up eventually making a greater percentage of our beef. All right. Um, as I said, it's a very consistent product. It's still, even though it's been around for a while, it's still in some infancy. And that's why I say, depending on the producer, depending on how that is done, the consistency of the product isn't necessarily there. But if you can, if the dairies start and they're, they're getting very good at this, start creating some of those consistent beef products, it's going to be an area of growth there. Will it replace the traditional native beef calf, um, it's going to change somewhat, but it's still the, the percentage of those animals is still significantly smaller than what would be the percentage of those uh, native beef animals. So I don't see it replacing it. I don't see it um, uh, a changing, I think it might change the makeup of somewhat in Wisconsin, not from the cow-calf side, but from what we're feeding out. If we can get those more consistent, we'll have a greater percentage of them being dairy on beef. Hey, tell me about infrastructure. Mark, when's the last time you heard of somebody building a new dairy? What is the temperature of processing plants? We, the, the last salvo you and I talked about was a big one in Michigan but there's others now that are popping. And then Brenda, you can follow him. I heard they're building a new meat processing facility in Iowa, an independent, so to speak. Uh, maybe give us just an update on who's got skin in the game on trying to expand some of our capacity, some of the infrastructure. Well, we've got um, a number of plants around the country that have added capacity. And as you indicated, there are a few places where we've had greenfield facilities. Uh, Michigan is certainly the poster child for that. Um, that plant in the center of the state is huge. Uh, they'll be able to process about 8 million pounds of milk a day when it's fully up and running and they aren't that far away from it. Um, you know, I think that one thing that we can read into that is that our, um, our powder prices always have to be competitive because you know, 50 to 70% of what we produce in the way of powder is being exported. So we've got to be competitive. We, we're at the world market price, or we are setting it. With cheese, sometimes we're in, sometimes we're not. Um, but I think that with the addition of this capacity that we've got right now, it will probably exceed um, our foreseen growth in uh, domestic consumption, which means that we're going to have to be in those cheese markets every day and all the time. We're going to have to cultivate that customer. They're going to expect those shipments. It also probably means that our prices, cheese prices, are likely to be uh, much more aligned with uh, these so-called world market prices or competitors there. Probably less volatility in class three as a result of that. Brenda? Um, yes, we're adding capacity. We're going to add, uh, as, as you're aware, like even um, we're adding capacity from a national perspective for, for both hog and for cattle production. But even when you look at um, Wisconsin, you know, we just had the grant that just closed, don't quote me on the date, um, where to basically where for smaller processors to be able to help in that. So there's, there's smaller capacities that are gonna be there. The majority of the additional capacity, you have some that are larger that are going to be trying to add um, and so when you look at some of these larger plants, so for example, Sioux Falls is trying to add um, uh, another processing for hogs in there, which is about 1,100 workers is what they anticipate that it will be required. You know, um, North Platte is trying to add. The, the concern that they have, the majority of them, is labor. 
how do you get the labor to be able to consistently operate? Um, that is, that's, it, it's, it's a COVID issue um, because of absenteeism, but it's also beyond COVID, beyond that of just being able to get the, the staff to be able to keep them operating. Well, we're hearing consistent themes, at least, as far as your Ag Outlook Forum is concerned. Thanks again to Mark and Brenda for giving us a little square perspective on things.